thanks everyone for joining us today. We're so excited to have some guest speakers for one of our classes. We have Mr. Jerry and Miss Phaedra from Courting Frogs Nursery. They're experts in carnivorous plants and they're gonna teach us all a lot about carnivorous plants, the different varieties, how to take care of them, how to maintain them over the winter, all kinds of good information. Um, so thanks for joining us today. And if you have any questions, I invite you to jot them down as we go through. I bet they'll answer a lot of them for us. But if they don't answer your question, um, send us an email. We're happy to answer any of them. So without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to Mr. Jerry and Ms. Phaedra. Thanks so much. Well, let's talk about a little bit um, of the care and how they adapted their leaves to consume insects. Well, the nearest plants basically live in habitats where nitrogen isn't that available, either from not being there or for, from the acidity of the soil, which is trying to know. This way, they can compete in that environment where other things that have trouble acquiring nitrogen don't do as well. Because they have such reduced area of leaf, this is vital for them. Otherwise, they would be swamped by grass and so on. In the case of Saracenias, their habit is maintained by fire. The fire burns through and takes out the competing grasses and small trees. And having a rise, these are rhizomatous plants. That will live. That's not going to be bothered by the fire. It's sort of left. And they should be coming back up. There's also Darlingtonia, which are the uh, pitfall traps that are native to uh, the West Coast, um, Southern Oregon and Northern California. Uh, let me grab that. Um, and like Jerry was saying, um, they also um, will benefit from fire. Uh, because again, these will uh, be, I guess will be uh, overgrown. Yes, by they will be overgrown and... rapidly. And um, <laughs> you want to look at this cobra here. Ooh, that is up here. This is a very interesting trapping method where the insect will land here on the tongue, as it were, of the cobra, or the fangs, if you prefer and it will start sucking up the nectar here. And they have a sweet nectar. You can look at it if you want to, it's not going to hurt you. But it does have, well, we'll do that for Saracenia. But if you look up underneath here, it's almost like a cathedral window. And when the insect wants to depart, it's going to go towards the light, which is coming through the patches, transparent patches, translucent patches on top. And so it's kind of like a one-way dead end trip. And Saracenias have similar trapping methods on some of them. You look at the Saracenia here, Saracenia minor, the large form, which go into Opie Kenopi, by the way. I love that word, Opie Kenopi. And once again, you have the same type of thing here. You don't have the fangs, but it's the same deal. The insect here, flies towards the light right now. Um, so that's convergent evolution on those two. On the taller ones, you can see on Saracenias, they're protected by the hood. So that otherwise they throw over water and simply collapse. On the short ones, that's not necessary. These are catching stuff just to try to fall in here, usually falling insects, sometimes flying insects. Slugs, and, um, snails. <laughs> yeah, lovely. <laughs> and they have, um, they have no digestive enzymes, but the taller ones do, because they're not going to get all washed out. Yeah, purpurea actually has two commensals that live inside it. This is a Saracenic purpurea. They have the largest distribution um, of any of the Saracenia, starting with types that go down to the Gulf, which are sometimes called Rosea. 
Now, there's quite a bit of rain in the forms of color for infant play, but they're basically all fairly short, open traps. We have a couple of commensal species of larval insects that sit in their process of stuff forms. Basically, they're living off bug crap as being deposited um, into traps. And back to the Darlingtonia. Okay. These are the same. These actually do not create an enzyme within their traps. They have a symbiotic relationship with mites and bacteria. Um, and that that's what aids the uh, digestion of the insects and uh, fed down into the rhizomes. So Arsenia sibicina has a very different type of trap mechanism. These plants are covered by water during part of the year. And their openings are shaped like a fish pond. And they're catching up potting organisms that migrate in there and get stuck. And of all the Saracenia, this is the only one that has that happen. Do, do the Cytosinas uh, have an enzyme? Or do they that have... we don't know. Okay. Or let's just say, I don't know if anybody knows, but I certainly don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Um, we have another type of pitfall trap um, that evolved um, with the same mechanisms, but completely different, but completely different part of the world. Uh, the Saracenia are all native to the east coast of the United States, ranging from Canada uh, down to the panhandle of Florida. Uh, these here are called Nepenthes, um, and this is from Southeast Asia. Um, they're not related to Saracenia at all, but they did have basically a convergent trap um, where they do develop a nectar and color that attracts the insects. And there's also a viscous liquid that is in the bottom of the traps uh, that is very sticky and sweet. Um, and some of them, they will bore the insects and fall into the viscous uh, fluid in the traps, or there's some traps that are designed just for mammals. Uh, shrews, for instance, um, they will develop, the Nepenthes traps will develop a sugary uh, crystallized sugar on top of the hoods um, that attracts the, the mammals, where the mammals will sit and eat that sugar and then poop into the traps, which feeds the plant. Sheer genius. <laughs> <laughs> it is genius. Okay, should we talk about Saracena habitat species? Sure, well? sure. Oh, uh, there's only about, oh, seven or nine species, depending on which taxonomists you believe in Saracenia. The distribution is mostly around the Gulf area, Florida Panhandle and then to the east. But Purpuria purpurea is a form, there's a northern form of Purpuria, which goes all up into the Canada, it's close to the Arctic Circle perhaps, but fully hardy hardy down to uh, minus 20 or underneath. And that's the only one of the Saracenias that is that whole tar. But we can use that ingredient. Otherwise, we have, we have the more southerly perps in a variety of beautiful forms. And we have the kind of what you might call albino forms. And we have the highly colored forms. And this is where I started out. I started out with a perp, and I still have and love these things. And going through the other species, we have a laga. This is one of the darker ones. And these grow from East Texas on West. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yep. That's what I'm here for. Yep. And we have Oreophila here. It's a beautiful clumpy plant. Just makes a big bouquet in the spring like this. Really intense. I love the way they just come up in a burst. And uh, they make a beautiful plant early in the year, which nursery stuff. And that one is an endangered species. There's a couple little sites in Georgia. 
Not much left. This is and, another. Uh, they tend to semester very early. This is a wonderful spring plant. Another we can't ship this out of state. Now, oh, well, here's another Oreopsis. You can see how highly colored the inside of the trap is and how it's starting to get striping on the outside. Let's consider it an ornate form. What about the flowers, Jerry? We're going to go to flowers now. Thank you. You got it. Okay, the flowers come all oh, down. No, 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 no. No, no, no. <laughs> Tangled up. Yeah. The way the flowers are, they easily tangle up. And it's one of the enduring frustrations of you and this other thing is. Sarasandia has come in several color forms. Up front, yeah. Like this is, um, this is what they call a cutthroat form. Guava has probably the most variation in colors. Well, the perks are good at that. <laughs> but we have some major groups here. This one is a cross between the southern population and northern population. I should say something about that. There are ones that come, say, from the Carolinas, North Carolina on south. But the Carolina population is somewhat hardier and basically is consisting of two different color forms. Maybe three, actually. There's a copria. Or a copper top. And here is a maxima. And the word maxima doesn't necessarily mean it's the biggest. It means it was the biggest the guy saw that named it. <laughs> and it has no real color besides the green. And really pure yellow green color to it. And where we got an ethical period. Okay. This is an ethical period, which is an all red form from the northern part of the range. And this is the rarest form, pretty much extinct in habitat. Fortunate to have it here. In fact, we're fortunate to have any Saracenias left. There's probably only 3% or less of natural habitat. The rest is all human caused degradation of the environment, um, an archipelago of small postage stamp reserves in a sea of pine plantations in Walmart. <laughs> okay, that takes care, I think, of the northern forms. And then the southern forms of the panhandle mostly. And this is Rugeli for the cutthroat. Some live before us and some ornata right here. Yeah, let's get them. Let's get them up here. Mm -hmm. Ornata form, heavy swiping. And oh, where are we here? There's the rubicora right there. Right here. Yes. Yes, yes thank you. <laughs> right in front of my nose. Flava rubicopora which is basically a red tube with a yellow and a red top. In some cases, the red becomes so extensive that it's all red. Technically, that would make it a natural purpurea also, like the northern form. But I'd like to keep those separate in my mind. I'm calling that a red purpurea because I don't want people to get the genetics all mixed up, although they will probably already have. <laughs> Okay, does that mainly cover the flowers, I think? Yeah. So you want to talk about um, the uh, leucophilus? Yeah. Let's right. do that. Okay, so here. Leucophilus are all southern populations. None of them go up into the, the north, up into the Carolinas. So they tend to be more tender. They don't really love our climate. They will live here but they don't love it. <laughs> and one of the things I'm doing is trying to make hybrids that are white that will love it. 
these always peak late in the season. This is unusual to have such a fall expression this early because they are kind of specialized in catching late insect flushes like moths and so on. And the white, they're white. So they kind of show up like ghosts in the moonlight. And um, the insects go to them, fill them right up. As a matter of fact, you can get a hundred separate insects in a trap like that. And uh, it does happen. Um, these work beautiful in hybridizing because that's really the only source of light for hybrids. And so do you want to talk about, about hybrids um, and like the natural hybridizing uh, of the Saracenia? Natural hybrids in a while. Mm -hmm. And how easy it is to cross them? Yeah, well, crossing them is easy, absolutely easy. Let's bring out a plant here that has a flower open. Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, here's Jerry well, at his best. You know, what happens here is that this cup here is actually a structure with the pistols on it. And it catches the pollen. And there's five little points here that carry the stigma loads. And I can just take the pollen like this, go like this, and go along the board. Look, I figure we'll go on to the next one. Got a little bit of Jerry jeans in yeah, there too. <laughs> very simple, very simple stuff. And they're all interfertile. All the species will cross one another. There are no berries, barriers to that. And um, that makes it so attractive to me. But there's so much that can be done. And all these different shapes in all these plants and colors can be combined in hybrids to produce other shapes and colors that you don't find in the wild population. This one is named for my wife, Elaine, it's Elaine's Ice and Fire. And it's got the red tube and the white top. This is something new that's just popping up. Other people look at too. And it's a damn good luck to look to it. And it um, should be easy now to make more. Easy in a sense to make it half doesn't mean it's fast. But you don't go to the best. Here is another look that has the red throat in it. It comes from Flava Bugilli and with a loop of phyla in it. And crosses like this are called morais, that is the crosses between flavas and lupophilas. And uh, they're beautiful too. A lot of work has been done on morais, but that doesn't mean there aren't a lot more beautiful ones coming along. Mm -hmm. What else we got? Let's talk about. You want to talk about Chinook? Yes, let's talk about Chinook. Mm -hmm. Chinook, there were two plants that I still have from the first crop of seedlings that I grew about 30 years ago. And um, this is. This plant doesn't make sense. I shouldn't have this plant because I can't remember having any plants early at this time that would have made a plant that looks like this that has white flowers. And yet it does. And this has been an amazing plant to work with too. I was really lucky on the first cross, not knowing what I was doing, to get a plant like this to work with because this gene's passed down really nice. Can we have one? Yes. See, here's a hybrid of that plant with a taller plant with the yep. Green's Colossus. Yep, here's the orange. And we have a very similar coloring here, but we're going to get taller plants. Some of them are about this tall. And all beautiful. Here's Doreen's, what just so that we, we can. Here's Doreen's. Mm -hmm. Let's at least show the massiveness of that. Okay, now this is Doreen's Colossus, which is a plant I got from the green cast about 30 years ago. It's a monster. It's an absolute monster, but it's not unlovely. Um, it has the characteristic of coming straight up. It's Oreophila times Flava hybrid, and it has a lot of hybrid vigor. 
I'm using this plant a lot in crossing. I'm still looking for a plant in other colors, and forms, that has the vigor of this plant. So far, not quite, but it is a really interesting world to follow. And I keep hoping for a hybrid that will have that much bigger. We, okay. we could go low to the ground and talk about the cordii. Okay. Now, cordii. This is a plant that I got from a nursery about maybe 35 years ago. One of the first plants I got. The same time I was making seed from this, or making seed that got to this. And you can see this plant is just kind of squat. The trap is now functional because it's a cross between two different forms. It's a cross between a set of cedar and a perk. I think a northern perk because the pedios are long and it's hardy outside. And a lot of people don't care much for this look, but you can make another cross, make another cross, then you can start opening up. But when you cross that cordia, with a local, you can start getting something like this. A vase-shaped or bowl-shaped plant and with that cross, you open this up again. And these can get quite large, as we saw with the monster. This is a plant that we're naming, or have named for Larry Melichan. The lot of pioneering work, Dr. Melichan, on hybridization of Saracenias. And I wanted to honor him with a plant that looks similar to what he was doing, but a little different. And this one is wonderful because once again, this plant works good year round. It puts up its old trap, blue traps with old traps and the flowers. So this plant can set in a nursery and look good all year round for sale. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, let's talk about Here's another one I think that's got either Chinook in it or Red Man. I'm not sure. Oh, no label. There's it. There is one. There, no, there is a label. Yeah. This is the range Colossus time for Pedrophila. Her Pedrophila is an anthocyanin free plant. Or basically, an all yellow one. It doesn't have any of the reds in it at all. And um, we can cross this. If I self this, I think you'll get 25% all green plants. Now that doesn't seem too exciting because it's going to be all green. But if we go with local crosses in AF, we can get this beautiful, just white and green look. And I'm a little behind on reading on that yet, but we do more and we're starting to get some very good plants on that. I want to recreate the other shapes of the plants in the anthocyanin free form and to have, have um, even more variety in the shapes and the colors of the plants. I don't know. Oh, let's see. Um, how about another monster? Let's see. Let's Okay, <laughs> let's get this out here. Thank you. Now this is a white, a white monster, basically white. And uh, I've never had one, a white plant with this white of wood before. And so that's exciting because Getting white hoods on basically white plants is something that I've been working on. This one is not exactly graceful. It's another monster, but it has its charm. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's another, oh, whoops, here's another monster. 
Okay, here we have a minor giant times Oreophila north south, which is an Oreophila that is a little shorter than, in fact, we had that here. We had that out here already. Unfortunately, with a minor giant, you know, Phaedra thinks this is a little too much, not quite pretty. <laughs> I tend to disagree. I like it a lot. <laughs> and uh, it'll be interesting to see what comes of that in crossing with other plants. Yeah. Good. All right. Are we wrapped up on this yet? I, I, what did we talk? We haven't talked about propagation. Oh, yeah. These plants are rhizomatous plants, the Saracenias. They have rhizomes like bearded iris under the soil. And they keep the rhizome is basically the stem. These are the leaves coming up from the stem. And it can be divided easily. Cut them up. I don't advise doing that in the spring or the hottest part of the summer, but any of the rest of the time you can cut them right up. They don't really like that. And, and soil. You can't really grow these things in native soil at least most people's native soil, or in standard mixes. They need an acid mix with very little nutrition in it. So we're using peat and perlite here. You can use pure peat or peat mixed with some other things. It's not critical, I think, on the exact mix because the plants seem to have a wide degree of tolerance on it, but they cannot have any lime in the soil. So commercial mixes are pretty much out. Besides most commercial potting soils that you buy in the big stores are crap. They're just not good. <laughs> okay, what else we got? Um, um, care, wet. We need to keep these things wet. These things need to sit in water. That makes water really early, easy because they sit in water. They sit in water year round. And they only need about this much water under something like this. But the range of water could be from here up to here. And they're fine with that. We do not want to put it over the top. And we can lay these out in flats. We can keep our pots in flats that don't leak like this, or in saucers, or in something fancier. And we can also plant them together. And then arrange them like this. This is a bog hole. And um, we have a little pot in here to pour water into so that we can see what the level is. And basically, this is kept saturated. You can. Make a hole about that far down so it will never go over the top. Or you can simply mount it up close to the top and it'll probably run off a lot of the top. And you can take some, this idea and make it much larger by having a tube bog outside. I wish we had a demo for you on that, but we've never been able to get to it. We're just too busy. But there are pictures out there that you can find on social media. And basically you're taking a liner, like a high grade blue liner, and putting it into a depression. And basically filling up with a media, which could be a mixture of peat and sand, or even pure sand, some people recommend. And um, just as long as it doesn't come up over the top, that's just a matter of securing some drainage, once again, a couple of inches down. And these can be quite beautiful. In fact, they're extraordinarily beautiful. And that brings up the hardiness factor as far as our climate goes. In winter, like we've had this last year, in most winters, you're not going to have any mortality on any of the species to the show. Once we get down, say, to 20 degrees, the very southernmost plants suffer from that and you could lose them. Putting a couple of layers of frost cloth over the top will extend the hardiness of all the species 
Um, it's kind of like hebes in New Zealand flats. You're fine for a few years and then bam. But you can cover these quite easily for a cold snap or you can concentrate on the hardier species that want from the northern part of the range or hybrid sea rifle. But I left a lot of these plants outside for several years after that cover. We've had no trouble at all with it. And um, that adds to the range of things that I can, uh, that I can cross for seed because they come up later and they go to bed. What else? So speaking of the bog, um, there is all types of companion plants. Um, in here, there's actually the Venus flytrap, um, which I guess we didn't really even talk about. Um, we should probably talk about those as well. Uh -huh. yeah. All right. so I've got some of our nursery pots back here. Uh, most of these um, we do work with tissue culture fly traps and also seed grown fly traps. And this would be um, a representation of the seed, seed grown. Fly traps are the gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they have a very interesting uh, trapping mechanism. Mm -hmm. They're considered to be our snapping traps. Um, there are trigger hairs. There's three trigger hairs on each side of the lobe of the leaf. And if one is touched, it doesn't shut. But if the same one or another one is touched within 20 to 40 seconds, mm -hmm. that's whenever it closes. So the plant will be able to basically tell between like debris or raindrops uh, hitting the leaf so it doesn't constantly close. Uh, it does take a lot of energy for this plant to be able to make this movement. Uh, so with us poking them and making them close, uh, it will kill them over time because it's basically like us not eating um, and running and running and running and running. You're gonna tire out. So the other thing too is with the Venus flytrap at this point, it's closed, but all they do is they just close their lashes. Um, and if there's still continued movement within that trap, that's whenever the whole trap will actually seal shut and release the digestive juices to break down the insect. Um, otherwise, it would basically just be dribbling its digestive juices everywhere, <laughs> which, uh, good thing, that's not what they do. <laughs> so we have the, the Venus fly traps. Did you have anything you wanted to add to them? Yeah, kids often find these, of course, because they are gateway drugs. They take them home, they torture them to death. But they can That's last a long time. They can thrive even for years. They're a better outdoor plant, like the Saracenia's root. But that's not the way most of them end up. Uh, they are resonance plants to those who are up. And over time, they can divide and spread, and they can be spread out. These plants are endemic to uh, southern North Carolina. There's only a hundred, hundred yard area that they're found. Um, there is now one area in the Panhandle of Florida um, that uh, the fly traps are showing up. Not sure if they were put there by humans or other animals, or if it is just a a freak. Okay, I, I believe that as well. I yes. felt like it was human. Um, mm -hmm. Let's go back to another plant that's in, that you can also plant in one of these bogs. Um, and we talked a little bit about it before, the sundews um, or the adhesive traps. Uh, let me grab some of those. So this one is a Drosera multifida. Uh, named because of the multiple branching on the leaves. And they do develop a very sticky mucilage on the leaves that ensnares the insects. And so basically the insect will get stuck, will start to struggle to get away, and more of those sticky tendrils will grab onto 
the insect. Uh, so it, there's no getting away. I think that might be the most horrible way to die, but there you have it. <laughs> but that won't happen to us with this one. <laughs> <laughs> this, one spirit that. <laughs> uh, this one here, um, I pulled out from outside. This one is a Drosera rotundifolia. These are actually native um, here, uh, here in Washington. Um, Drosera are actually a plant that is found on every continent except for Antarctica, I believe. Yet. Yet. It's getting warmer. <laughs> <laughs> and then speaking of mm. adhesive traps, these won't live in a bog situation, uh, but these actually are probably best for windowsill plants. Uh, this one is called a butterwort or pinguicula. Um, pinguicula in Latin means little greasy one. Uh, they develop a, a grease on their leaves that attracts insects, also the colorations of them too. Uh, and they work well for fungus gnats, fruit flies. Um, I have even seen mosquitoes on, on their leaves. Uh, and these are more of a tropical species and they wanna be kept drier. Jerry was mentioning earlier that uh, for soil, that you do not want to use lime with any of these other plants. This one is one that actually will benefit from a little bit of lime in their soil. They grow on hillsides and uh, uh, mountainsides in Mexico. They also get these lovely flowers, which just makes me happy. <laughs> And even on the stem going up to the flower also has that grease. Uh, so you will see fungus gnats and fruit flies stuck to the, to the stem as well. What else do we have? We have a lady been waking the two, but it doesn't look like much, a hardy one. I don't try to go on because they're just not very substantial or very pretty or make much of a show of themselves, but we do have them here. We do, the mm -hmm. macroceras. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a few different drosteras um, and do we have any bladder worms that are native here? No, I don't think so. We don't talk about utricularia now. We should talk about utricularia, but I realized that I don't think I have any to show, which is kind of surprising. Aha! Uh -huh. Don't we have any angry bunnies at all? Uh, no angry bunnies right now, okay. but we do have some volunteers. Uh, <laughs> they have a very interesting clapping. They are the most sophisticated. I believe so, and apparently even the fastest. Uh, so this one here is Utricularia uh, bisquamata. Um, and these are just the flowers off of the stolons. They don't actually have a leaf structure, even though it kind of looks like leaves to us. Um, all of the action with the bladder warts are underneath the soil. They have on their root system, they will develop these bladders um, that has trigger hairs on the outside. And so if there's microscopic insects, that are walking by, it'll trigger one of those hairs and it creates a suction within the bladder that sucks the insects inside. Yes. This vaccine is best appreciated under a dissecting score. Definitely. <laughs> and Utricularia is another one like the Drosseras. Uh, they are found on every continent except for Antarctica. You know, it's strange that the Venus flytrap is so popular, it's beautiful, it's so effective and efficient, and yet it's not that successful. It's, it's a finicky plant. Yeah, well, it's not hard to keep as long as you don't just keep them in the dark and torture it to death. Um, what else we got? So we should talk about uh, their, how to grow them. Uh, most of these, most of these plants would do better outdoors. Uh, the Venus flytrap, like I was saying, they're from North Carolina. Uh, their zone 
eight, I believe, which is us as well here in the Northwest. Um, so I have kept fly traps outside and I have killed a lot of them. I have discovered that um, there, the rainy season is the opposite in North Carolina versus, versus here in the Northwest. Um, right now, summertime, uh, North Carolina is getting all of their rain. Um, so the fly traps will be submerged most of the time underwater uh, to where they have a dry season during the winter. Um, I have found uh, planting them in something tall in a taller pot so that the rhizomes aren't sitting in water uh, during the winter and rotting. Um, another thing like Jerry was saying as well, um, I have covered them with just some clear plastic during the winter. Um, when the sun comes out, it creates a little bit of condensation, which will give them the moisture that the plant will need to go through the winter. I've had the most of the winter here. A mild winter like we had last time, they wouldn't have any trouble, I think, sitting outside in pots. As long as their rhizomes are not sitting as in water. As long as we do not want them to sit in water during the winter. I found out out the hard way early <laughs> in the game. Yeah. Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so definitely. Um, companion bogs are a way to go for outdoors. Um, but if you are looking for plants that are going to be best for indoor growing, that would be the pinguiculas or butterworts. And this one is called a Mexican pinguicula because these are the ones that are going to be found in um, cent Central America. Um, or there's the nepenthes. So these two are the best for indoor growing and then everything else would be better for outdoors and wanting that dormancy period. But in general, Saracenias should not be kept inside. Darlingtonias can't live inside. They have to have cool water. Darlingtonias are this is about the only place where they're really happy in the Northwest. They live in southern, uh, northern California, the southern Oregon. Cold water flows through the woods all the time. If you want to keep one inside, you better put ice cubes in the soil. <laughs> Even outside, especially Even outside. like, yeah, um, the, uh, mm -hmm. the past few days have been pretty hot. So where they're native up in the Siskiyou Mountains, um, they are in full sun. Uh, but they, their roots are being watered by glacier water that's melting off the mountain. Um, so as long as you're able to mimic that, then you can keep them in full sun. Um, what we do here at the nursery um, is we have them in more of a, a shaded greenhouse. Um, I always say, if you're gonna grow them outdoors, put them in kind of a shadier spot where they can get full sun up until about noon. And then after that, just a dappling of light. And on really hot days like today or yesterday, drop a couple ice cubes on top of their soil. As long as the water that you're using as ice cubes um, has very low minerals. Mm -hmm. And that I think is something that we should be discussing. I thought of that, but yeah, right. Uh, here in the Northwest, especially up here in Stanwood, it gets about 10 degrees colder on a cold night and 10 degrees cooler on a hot night than it does in Seattle. And we find they'll just sit in, um, they'll just set beds out there in the pots and water beds and they're fine because it cools off at night. In other areas of the country, you don't get that strong cool off at night and that makes it really hard to grow in other areas of the country. So something else I think that we haven't discussed is actually water and water quality. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so could, the nice thing is um, our city water, municipal water in Seattle and the surrounding areas um, has very low minerals in the water, which means uh, total dissolved solids. Um, as Jerry had mentioned earlier, um, they, they grow in very nitrogen poor soil uh, and they basically can, the roots don't work like normal green plants. Uh, they 
do not absorb nutrients uh, through their uh, through their roots. Uh, that's why they adopt, adapted their leaves to consume insects. Um, so the water itself has to be very low in minerals. Um, if we have well water, like we use well water here at the nursery, um, we actually have to run it through a reverse osmosis uh, to basically take out any kind of minerals that are in the water. I would qualify that a bit. Sure. That is, um, our water is coming out of the ground at 200 parts per million or 180. And, that's and I found awesome. that if we use that in the greenhouse, evaporating concentration would kill the plants very quickly. But I found outside that we can use well water on the ones outside because in the winter it all washes out from rain. But I would not do that inside or in the greenhouse. But um, the range of tolerance for the groundwater, as far as being um, leached out every year in the spring and uh, for, well, for the winter basically, <laughs> is um, I normally wouldn't advocate using water with winter parts of the but it works in this circumstance. If that doesn't mean it's going to work in other circumstances. So rule of thumb, use water that is very low in, in minerals. Uh, I would say probably the highest um, for most plants because the Venus flytraps and uh, the Drosera are a little bit more sensitive yes. than the Saracenia. Uh, so anything that's lower than, I would say 80 parts per million, um, should be okay. The plant should be okay. But you do want to change the water out. If you're keeping the plant sitting in water for a long time, and any dissolved solids you have in there can build up to that where the concentration, so you want to change it up. Yeah, salt doesn't dissipate uh, like water does. Uh, so you do need to make sure that it gets rinsed out. That's why the ocean is over. <laughs> Yeah. So can I ask some questions? No. Man, no. <laughs> no way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Jerry, how long have you been growing these? How long have we been growing them? About 30 years. I evolved into it by accident because I just want some fly traps to add to the mix of the succulents that I was selling. And when I got the first Saracenius for the order, they flowered and then I was lost. I was lost in them. I had to cross them. I love growing stuff from seed. I didn't know what I was doing at first. And I learned a lot of stuff the old hard way. And I'm still learning. You start, stop learning, you're basically dead. But, um, and it's still, it's still a path I've followed. It's still a something that I just basically have to do. You put down several thousand seed every year. The more seed you plant, the more possibilities you have to put in. And, uh, and that's a rhythm I'm accustomed to, and I'm totally immersed in it. I cannot help myself. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so we've talked about, you guys mentioned uh, good companion plants or ones that go together. Are there any species or varieties that just do not coexist and you should make sure you leave out of your bog garden? That would be the Nepenthes and the Pinguicula. Um, yes, so it would definitely be those two species. Excellent. And you guys have mentioned that they can go in containers in the ground. Is there one that you recommend over the other that's a little bit more foolproof or easier to, to manage? That I'm not sure of. The only thing that I would say is um, I've gotten a lot of these very nice ceramic pots. Um, and then with having water in them through the winter, after a couple of years, they crack and break. Um, so we have, we've been using plastic, um, and as Jerry said, um, drill a hole about an inch down, a few holes on the sides so that whenever we do get a 
a lot of rain, the plant doesn't capsize. If you have a bowl that's shaped like this, rather than one that's shaped like this, if it's shaped like this, with no lift, the whole ice thing can lift right up out of the pot when it freezes. And, but you don't want to use natural clay because when that freezes, it just chips all over the place. It would have to be uh, ceramic. Ceramic or plastic? Or plastic. Is there anything special if they are in a container that um, we, we talked about being them being able to survive over the winter here for us in the Northwest, but is there anything you need to do extra if they're in a container versus in the ground? I mean, you guys mentioned plastic over the top of them, but because they're a little bit more exposed and vulnerable, is there anything we should be mindful of? If you have that container setting up on table or something, it's much more vulnerable than it is for ground contract. If you simply set it down on the ground, maybe put a couple layers of, of um, Rime over it, that should do it under most winters. We had a minus three here once. I hope that never happens again. I lost a lot of stuff that year, but I did not lose the purpurea purpurea because it didn't care at all about minus three degrees. Um, the winters we've had, nothing's been bothered for the last few years. Nothing has been uh, troubled by the cold for the last few years. You can get ice on it, uh, but what happens when they're frozen, they can freeze dry because they can't pick up any water and they can actually dehydrate in that condition and that can actually kill them too. All right. Um, so do these actually help control pests that we have in our yards, like normal every day, you know, whether they're the indoor or outdoor varieties, I mean, do these help manage kind of our common pests? Are they? Uh, so they, they develop a nectar, um, and the colorations of the plant that actually lures the insects. Uh, so not so much as pest control, but it's pretty exciting whenever you look down in one of the traps and it is just full of yellow jackets and wasps. Uh, yeah, but no, I don't think it really is actually going to control uh, your insects. You know, back in the colonial times, these things stretch for hundreds of miles mm -hmm. in these uh, wet savanna lands and the insects did not suffer greatly from it at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, and kids, if love have... me. kids love these things. This is a wonderful thing. You can set something like this on your deck, your patio, or whatever. And if it was petunias, it'd just be petunias. But this has intellectual component. It catches bugs. And it's a great teaching tool. And it's a great draw for people. Endlessly fascinating, sitting out there, watching the bugs buzz around them, and then go, Poop. there is common need. They do get drunk on this stuff, on the nectar, and that makes them more stumbling and easier to fall in. Yeah. Basically getting shanghai by a plant. Yeah, <laughs> really. <laughs> Yeah, I was just going to ask that. They are so cool, which is, I think, what attracts a lot of people to growing these, especially like you mentioned kids. It's a great thing to get kids involved and teach them um, how plants work. But is there any sort of toxic element to them for kids or pets, you know, common domestic animals that people should be worried about? Or are they pretty harmless to humans? And They're pretty harmless. Um, I... My, our, we just read, we rescued a dog a few years ago and uh, it was right at the time whenever I would be cutting back all of the pitchers and he would take all of the dead pitchers and uh, rip it open and eat all the bugs um, that were inside the pitchers. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, he yeah. loves them. Uh, the Nepenthes, he likes these too because there's a good crunch to it. Um, and there's that viscous fluid in there. Viscous fluid. Uh, there's also, um, I've had friends of mine that have uh, Drosera. Their cats chew on it. They rub up against them. Uh, and mm -hmm. to no, no, no ill effect to the cats. 
That's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe so, even medicinal uses of some of these. Some people think so. I have not explored that. Um, is there anything to be mindful of when you first plant these? Like, uh, you know, sometimes with greener, more traditional plants, we talk about, you know, uh, kind of opening up some of the root boundness before you plant them. Is there anything like that you should be mindful of when you first plant these and, or, you know, when you bring them home? It's almost impossible to kill these for anything like that. As long as they're wet and as long as they have enough roots. That's why in really hot weather, you want to be careful if you're taking them apart because the stress from the heat is much higher. But I propagate these by division Saracenas year round. And um, if you get them in the right location, full sun, lots of water, um, Saracenia are almost bulletproof. They yeah. are a fantastic plant for the garden. And because they sit in water, there's no decision to make them whether they should water. Mm, yeah. They just need to sit in water. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So are there things you should do throughout the year, like every spring you should do this kind of maintenance or, you know, every fall, are there some general kind of guidelines throughout the year to help them grow their best and look their best? We normally in February, like end of January and February, we will go in and for most of the species of Saracenia, um, we will, uh, let's see, let's see on this one. Um, cut all of the old traps basically down to the soil. Um, what this is doing is getting rid of the old traps, plus it's also helping more sun get down to the rhizome so that it can create this year's uh, growth. Um, but there's also the purpureas that we were talking about. Um, these here, their traps actually um, die back uh, biannually. Um, so you don't need to cut the traps off of these until they look like they're completely rotten. And that's also the same with the Darlingtonia. The Darlingtonia, the traps, um, they don't die back every year. Uh, so as long as it doesn't look completely rotten, you can leave them on. And that would also be the same for like the Drosera, they're all going to die back. So you would just cut them back all the way to the soil. Fly traps, they normally will keep um, a few traps really close uh, to the soil. Um, and then as the days start getting longer and warmer, then it will spit up new traps. And the traps they produce in the summer tends to be tall so they can get above the grass and other competing uh, vegetation. And they make sessile traps lay right down on the ground during the winter. And uh, in the spring too. How about dormancy? Oh, yeah, let's talk about dormancy. Saracenias go dormant during the winter. Obviously, that's when they stop, but their roots don't stop. These plants are not completely dormant ever. They're still capable of making root growth during the winter. And it's um it's important to remember that the plants are also photosynthesizing during the winter and whatever, whatever traps they have left. And keeping them in the dark during the winter, you can wander them over in the garage. Um, but I like to keep them where they can be photosynthesizing your life. So I have one last question for you. So for those of us that are, are brand new, have never grown these before or have maybe tried and failed, what are some good, you know, general tips or tricks to help us be successful in growing these plants? Water and sunshine on the Saracenium. And the fly traps, the sundews. Uh, those definitely the Saracenia. They are the, um, out of all of them, they're probably the easiest. Uh, to grow, but yes. These are not fragile plants. These are not hard to grow. I mean, they look exotic, so it looks like they might be difficult, but they're not. They're not really difficult at all. They have minimal uh, environmental needs that have to be met. 
but no more so than for other plasters. And it's different. And they are really easy to keep in my opinion. Um, obviously, we could have had two of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so don't be afraid. Just jump in and start growing them, right? <laughs> yes. Excellent. <laughs> You guys covered so much information. We're so grateful that you shared your knowledge with us. Um, I'm sure there will be plenty of questions that pop up, which we are happy to answer. Um, you know, shoot us. You can shoot all of your questions here to us at Sunnyside Nursery, um, and we'll kind of be the gateway and pass them on to Jerry and Phaedra at Courting Frogs. Um, but any questions at all that pop up now or later as you're growing them, we're happy to discuss plants. We love plants, and I'm sure so do Jerry and Phaedra. They wouldn't be growing all of these really cool plants. Um, so make sure you reach out. Um, we really appreciate you joining us today. For those of you uh, that are close to the nursery, as always, we have a discount on all of these plants. We bring in all of these plants that Jerry has been talking about. We buy them exclusively from Courting Frogs Nursery. So we have them here in Sunnyside Nursery. They're 20% off as well as the bog soil. We have that already made up and ready and easy to go for you. All of that's 20% off starting today, Saturday the 5th, all the way through Friday. Um, so hopefully you get a chance to enjoy the beautiful weather and come down and um, see all these really cool plants in person that they've spent so much time and effort growing. Um, and then hopefully you join us for our next class. We'll be back next Saturday on the 12th for balcony gardening, small space. A lot of us have that. So we really appreciate you joining us today. Thanks so much, Jerry and Phaedra. We appreciate all your knowledge and we'll see you next time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.